Now for tonight's speaker, Dr. William C. Walforth. Dr. Walforth will be addressing tonight uh, a very interesting topic on the world in which the international environment in which the United States will be, as we say, uh, acting. Specifically, I've asked him to address the, the argument of the shifting polarity of the future world. Is the, is the world uh, international environment sh shifting from a unipolar world to a multipolar world? And if so, to what extent? How will this shift take place? How will the United States have to act? Because we're used to acting for at least the past couple of years in a sort of multipolar or unipolar world. How will we have to change? What will we have to do? What will that multipolar world look like? And how will we have to adapt? Now, Dr. Wolforth is the Daniel Webster Professor of Government at Dartmouth College. He is also the Editor-in-Chief of the journal Security Studies and is on the editorial board of the Cambridge Studies in International Relations. Very uniquely, he brings to, to our um, group tonight both a theoretical and a practical background because his interests lie in not only international relations theory, uh, as you would have uh, learned back in graduate school, but also the practical issues related to international security. What happened in the Cold War? How did Russian foreign policy evolve and adapt in former periods? Now, Dr. Wolforth has previously taught at Georgetown and Princeton Universities. He has also written and co-authored and edited numerous books and articles, including World Out of Balance, International Relations Theory and the Challenge of American Primacy with Stephen G. Brooks, Unipolarity, Status Competition, and Great Power War, as published in World Politics, The Balance of Power in World History, which he edited with Richard Little and St Stuart Kaufman, and International Relations Theory in the Case Against Unilateralism with Stephen G. Brooks in Perspectives on Politics. Dr. Wolforth received his MA in International Relations as well as a master's and doctorate in political science from Yale University. Please join with me and welcome Dr. Wolforth. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. Um, if you think that introduction was in any way impressive, uh, it pales by comparison with the effect produced by glancing over the participant list uh, of tonight's invitees. The people stand, sitting before me are a quite impressive bunch. I'm, it's kind of intimidating to have to uh, address such a group. Imagine if you were up here addressing all of these people with all of these acronyms after their names. I'm worried that after this thing is over, Mike's going to give me a quiz. I'm going to have to identify what these things mean. You know, can you really talk about American grand strategy if you can't identify every single one of these acronyms? Um, why should we listen to you? Um, no, I appreciate very much uh, the invitation to come here. It's a great uh, honor. And I shall uh, try to do my best to address at least some of the questions uh, Mike raised. I think my presentation is going to deal mainly with that context uh, of American foreign policy, the context of American grand strategy. Uh, as we gather here tonight, I think it's quite clear that there is a mood uh, uh, in this country and abroad, uh, a mood of crisis uh, of American foreign policy, a mood of change in the international system, that we're on the cusp of a new era, and that this change and this crisis are linked in the sense that U.S. foreign policy may be encountering these crises, this mounting set of challenges, this dwindling sense of resources and solutions. They might be encountering that crisis because of the changes in the international system, in particular because the international system is shifting from something called unipolarity to something called multipolarity, which is a shift that should occasion, so the argument goes, a rethinking of American grand strategy. And I have tonight a, an answer, a response to that mood that I can summarize in one word, bunk. <laughs> or if you prefer, balderdash, or maybe piffle, or 
it's wrong. Um, in more polite terms, what I want to do in my remarks to you is push back against this basic presumption that we are encountering a major shift in the basic structure of the international system that is going to cause a fundamental or should cause a fundamental rethinking, a ground up review of American grand strategy. Those of you who are here for the Walter Russell Mead talk, which I had the pleasure of viewing online, will have had a wonderful, a historical, excellent description of that grand strategy. The question is, is that broad, engaged, leadership-oriented grand strategy going to be compelled to change in the near future because of a shift in the global distribution of power? I'm going to answer negatively to that question. In particular, I'm going to make six points, which means I'm going to have to keep moving. And if you notice that I've gone from point one to point four, then I hope you enjoyed your nap. This is a way of kind of keeping uh, uh, up with what's going on. But here are the points I'm going to make just to foreshadow where I'm going. I'm going to say the following things. First, that the international system is, in fact, unambiguously unipolar. It still is. I'm going to argue that that's not likely to shift towards either bi or multipolarity for many decades. In a sense that, well, the United States will have the ability, if it wishes, to change its grand strategy in a different direction. It won't be compelled to do so by a change in the basic structure of international politics over the policy relevant future. I say policy relevant future because I don't think, with the exception of a few weapon systems, I don't think that most policy planning beyond the 20 year horizon is particularly relevant in the American context. Uh, third, I think that this distribution of capabilities that we call unipolarity uh, conveys benefits uh, on the United States. These benefits are sometimes hard to see in a world that is in which challenges to the United States' interests are so salient, but nonetheless, I will suggest that those benefits are significant. Fourth, uh, I will argue that maintaining uh, this unipolar system is not especially costly for the U.S. When I say not especially costly, I mean no disservice to the men and women who are serving and to the taxpayers who are paying their taxes. I mean especially costly in comparison to the kinds of commitments this country and other countries have made in the past in different international systems. Fifth, I'm going to argue that it, of all the grand strategies the United States might follow, an activist leadership oriented grand strategy, which is indeed the one Walter Russell Mead described in this forum, is probably best suited to furthering U.S. interests. And finally, six, I'll conclude by saying that the most important foreign policy questions the United States faces are, in fact, domestic, not foreign. Okay? So that's where I'm going. To begin with, we have to start with the boring part. You've got to do boring first. I've learned that through years of lecturing, which is to define your terms. Now, you're going to hear unipolarity and multipolarity mentioned all around the world by various analysts, political leaders, I always would say, you know, look for how they're defining that term. 99.5% of the time, they don't offer a definition. So I'll give you a definition by which polarity refers to how usable capabilities are distributed among the most powerful states in the international system. Why do we focus on these so-called great powers? It's because for, for ill or for good, they have the most capacity to shape the international setting, some 80% of GDP, 90% of military spending is made up of, is made up, is accounted for by a relatively short list of so-called great powers. How capabilities are distributed among those actors importantly shapes the landscape of world politics. And so with that definition of polarity, you can think of unipolarity as a distribution of measurable capabilities among states such that there is only one superpower. There is one state that is unambiguously and clearly above the rest in terms of basic capabilities. Rather simplistically, I warrant, this graph shows how military expenditures in GDP is, are distributed among often named major powers today. The uh, implication of those measures, simplistic as they are, I think, 
is, uh, the implications are that what you have is one power whose capabilities in across the board are put it in a class by itself, such that it's a world essentially with one superpower. Does it, this doesn't mean that the United States is omnipotent. It doesn't mean that it always gets what it wants. It doesn't mean that the United States is a global empire or the United States is more powerful than every single other country combined or the United States can effortlessly go overthrow regimes and create democracy in far off lands without expending too much. It means none of those things. It means simply there's one power in the world with a global reach capacity, one power capable of assembling major coalitions, one power whose measurable capabilities, again, put it in a class uh, by itself. Now the measures presented here on this graph are very simplistic, as I've suggested. The U.S. position in reality rests on a much more varied and uh, complex foundations that encompass investments made over many, many decades in institutions and in capacities and alliances and partnerships and various mechanisms the United States uses to exercise leadership. Nonetheless, I don't think the numbers lie too much in showing the United States as a power that does not have an unambiguous peer in the international system. Now, when we think about multipolar, uh, unipolarity, we need to compare it not to imagined worlds of effortless U.S. leadership. We want to compare it not to the Roman Empire. We want to compare the U.S. position not to the position of a deity or a god, as many analysis do. We want to compare it to actual other international systems that have actually existed, and those generally can fall into one of two other possible types of polarities, bipolarity and multipolarity. So by my definition of polarity, bipolarity is a system with two superpowers. As we recall from the good old Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union. Here we have GNP and military expenditures, poor proxies for the reality of the Cold War. And this is from 1950, which was a situation which in which two states, the United States and the Soviet Union, loomed sufficiently far above the rest to shape how international politics played out. Their enmity, their rivalry, their occasional detente uh, very powerfully influenced world politics around the world, a two superpower world. Multipolarity is, of course, a system when there are no superpowers, just a lot of great powers. This graph shows you multipolarity, a, a system which basically was typical of international relations from the period in which the modern international system comprised itself in the 17th century uh, up until the end of the Second World War. So most of modern international history. You had a world in which there's a lot of powers, some better at some things, some better at others, some really good at naval capability, some really good with powerful armies, some having a little bit of both. This is 1870, roughly, showing a world of you know, five or six great powers, none unambiguously looming over the rest overall, although there may have been, say, one, Britain, that dominated in one class of power, naval power, or one, Russia, which had particular capabilities in, in land power. So that is a multipolar world, a, polar, a world of peers at the great power level. So the question we're asking really today is how soon are we going to be in a world like that? A world where if I were to graph out uh, the capabilities of all the major players, they'd look kind of roughly comparable. Um, and my answer to that is, of course, my second point, which is that's going to be a long, long time. How long? Don't know. Future can't be forecast. But you've got to try when you're making grand strategy. And I think if you try to forecast, it's, it's going to take a long time. I'm not saying that history is frozen, not saying there's no change, not saying China is not rising very fast. It's just going to take a while. So as we move to my second graph, I will make a rare self-reference. I'm 50 years old. I've been around for 50 years. And uh, this graph captures the US share of the world economy over that 50-year period, which, as you can see, fluctuated from some 24 or so percent when I was born and dropped down into the low 20s during the disco years 
of the 1970s and uh, 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 reclaimed a good part of its uh, former stature uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s and since has gone back down to almost, if not below, disco levels of low 20s. Now, if you look at that thing, you know, whether those are huge changes or not, it depends on the question you're asking. I think in terms of the global position of the United States as a very rough measure of where it stood economically, it doesn't suggest a huge amount of change. But if you look back over that period and think, you know, I look at the audience now, it seems like most people are younger than I am. But if you look back over that period, we were in crisis. The U.S. was declining most of the time. Most of the time. It was a crisis. It's always a crisis. 1960, John F. Kennedy ran on the so-called missile gap argument. But that wasn't just a missile gap. That came. If you go back and look at the campaign rhetoric of the 1960 campaign, it wasn't just a missile gap. It was we had decisively declined under the Republican administration. John, uh, 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 in his 1957 book, Nuclear Weapons and U.S. Foreign Policy, Henry Kissinger intoned, he always intones, he intoned another 15 years of decline such as the, we have just experienced will leave the United States hunkered down in North America, lonely and scared. Um, so we were declining then. Of course, we were declining after our troubles in Southeast Asia. Uh, we were declining uh, and facing a foreign policy crisis. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger indeed proclaimed during their administration that we were already in a multipolar world. We, of course, it was mourning in America under Ronald Reagan, but the intellectuals and commentators never believed him. He never managed to convince Paul Kennedy, for example, and many other observers who were convinced in the 1980s that the United States was declining owing to its fiscal overstretch. And of course, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was Japan as number one. The U.S. had a terrible political economic system. The Japanese had found the secret to how to run a modern economy, and we were toast. So we've been declining all of these years. The big lesson is actual changes in fundamental power balances take a long time to eventuate. So in each of these cases, what you were having, what you were experiencing was a uh, real trend in the world. In each case, there were real things happening. People were legitimately concerned about them. And yet, what they did was they extrapolated some trend into the future and read it back into the present. They saw some problem like the, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, failure to achieve its objectives in Vietnam or uh, the relative decline of the United States economy compared to the rising, flourishing economies that, as they recovered after the Second World War, they took, they took some trend and saw into the future that trend, extrapolated it back into the present, and overinterpreted the significance, the present day significance of that trend. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I think is ha happening now and is largely accountable for this mood of dramatic change and potential crisis. Um, a trend is not the same as an existing relationship. This graph shows the 2008 situation vis-a-vis -vis China. Namely, these bars represent Chinese GDP here on the left, GDP per capita and military expenditures as a percentage of the comparable figures for the United States. What the, again, this is a snapshot. These, 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 these statistics are, are arguable in some respect, but I think they capture the reality that pretty much everybody who seriously looks at the situation agrees. That is that China is rising, but it hasn't yet risen to peer status, and in fact has a very long way to go. In fact, I'd invite you to think about the fact that we've been here before. This shows Japan in 1996 with the very same measures, um, owing in part to a very inflated Japanese currency. But even if you use uh, purchasing power parity, parity measures, the Japanese compared to the United States in the early to mid-1990s looked on many indexes like a far more, looked, uh, shall we say, looked far closer to being a peer competitor of the United States in terms of power potential than China does today. So if you compare the two, 
with Japan on the left-hand bar and China on the right-hand bar, you will get the point that I'm making, which is not necessarily, by the way, that China is, going to, is undergoing a bubble economy like China, uh, Japan was and that China is going to go through 20 years of stagnation the way Japan has. I'm not making that forecast. I'm simply suggesting that today, as happened in the late 80s and early 90s, we are taking a trend and changing it into a, 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 a relationship that currently exists. So because the gap in capabilities between the United States and the number two power is sufficiently large, it's going to be a, large, a long time uh, before unipolarity gives way to a power distribution like the one I showed you before of multipolarity. Indeed, if you look at the current trend, if you focus on what people are talking about, which is the rise of China growing at 10% a year, growing this year even over 8% notwithstanding the financial crisis, that trend is not towards multipolarity. That trend is towards bipolarity. Unless you're going to make the argument that Brazil and India or the EU are going to be great powers. Uh, so um, we're probably a long way off from a power shift uh, of the nature that people are talking about. And with that, I will. Um, so the bottom line there, excuse me, to, to conclude my second point, and by the way, I should let you know that these points will pass more rapidly as we move through the talk. That's a key tactic to keep people from falling asleep. Another one is to turn that off so you don't stare at that graph. Um, the, big, the big point is, of, uh, 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 is uh, uh, my second major point can be summarized as a discussion of the need for a new grand strategy to deal with multipolarity is premature. That's not to say we shouldn't debate America's foreign policy, that there aren't things that should be changed. It simply says it's early to suggest that the rise of new power centers compels the United States to rethink its grand strategy. That brings me to my third point, that this situation, which I'm suggesting is going to be with us for several decades, conveys many benefits on the United States. And these benefits uh, may be hard to see in a world beset with challenges where we naturally focus on current problems and challenges that sometimes seem insoluble. We tend to forget bad things that could happen that aren't happening. And what I'd like to suggest to you tonight is that there are some pretty bad things that aren't happening, and they're not happening probably or at least partly because power is distribu distributed in a unipolar fashion. Um, and I'm just going to pick out one thing. I could talk about others, but let me just focus on one thing that we don't see today, that we could see again if the world were to become bipolar or multipolar. And that thing is direct military rivalry between great powers. That thing is balancing in the classic hard balancing sense, balance of power politics between great powers. That is what I'd like to call sort of hegemonic rivalry for leadership of the international system between great powers. That's when great powers take big chunks of their capabilities and throw them at each other. If not in direct warfare, then in indirect competition in third areas through proxies, um, through arms races, intense arms races that are either technological or quantitative. Uh, this thing, this thing, this great power rivalry is present today in the international system only in its most muted forms. Yes, it exists, but it can't be compared to the degree and intensity of great power conflict that typified international relations for most of history. Let me just give you a few quick examples uh, to remind you, if I can, to do a little bit of history, because you know Walter Russell Mead did history, and even though I'm a political scientist, I got to do a little bit of history um, to remind you of what balancing and great power rivalry in its classical form was actually like. And I'm going to think about you know some examples that are sort of hard examples, examples which look like states that should be in pretty strong positions internationally, comparable to what the United States is in now but which faced these kinds of 
threats and rivalries. One is Britain, when it was at the top of the international heap. Great Britain, through its period of leadership of the international system, always faced potential peer rivals that were just short of mounting major challenges to the British position across the globe, and in fact did so on numerous occasions. So to take you back, if any of you are getting tired, well, this will be exciting, take you back to the 18th century, when Britain ruled, Britannia ruled the waves, didn't it? But if you look back at that period, actually France, which was already a far more formidable land power than Britain, France was always just a few years away from having the potential to create naval power sufficient to challenge Britain throughout its empire and call into question its global position. All it would take in Paris was a few years of good government, few good fiscal, all right, you're laughing, but, you know, a few years of good government, some good sound fiscal policies to get the lucre to build a navy, and next thing you know, they'd be out. And they did it actually three times. They did it in the series of events that preceded and led up to the Seven Years' War. They sent squadrons off to India to support Britain's, uh, the Raj's opponents in India. They intervened in North America. They intervened in the Caribbean. Later on in the, seventh, in the 18th century, well, you know, we're standing here in this country called the United States of America, in part because France weighed in decisively in the counterinsurgency war that Britain was having to fight against those pesky American colonists. How would those colonists have done as insurgents without ships of the line, frigates, supplies, and other supports from the great uh, French uh, nation across the oceans? So numerous occasions of the 18th century, you saw great powers going at it in the periphery of international politics, throwing uh, weight in the scales against British leadership in a way that today the United States does not have a comparable kind of concern. It has many concerns. But the idea that another great power is going to throw itself full tilt on the side of America's opponents uh, with its direct military involvement of main forces is not something that is currently happening in international politics. Um, so there was, of course, uh, Britain ultimately, in a, in a devastating war, ultimately, together with Russia, defeated France. In the 19th century, uh, Russia stepped into the breach as a new potential peer rival of Britain. Uh, didn't have a great navy, but had another way of reaching the British Empire. Instead of going at it across oceans, why not just expand our empire all the way until it practically gets to India? Which created a kind of concern for British leadership in international politics, which was quite acute, which we tend to forget. And once Russia declined after the First uh, World War temporarily, of course, we know that Germany stepped into the breach as a major uh, peer uh, competitor of Britain. All right, those are old examples. A much more apropos case, of course, would be the Cold War itself. If you want to remember what the cost of peer competitor uh, 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 status is, the cost of a bipolar kind of strategic setting, just think back to the Cold War when the United States faced a committed superpower which created, attempted to create, I should say, across the board, symmetrical capabilities to balance the United States. Didn't always succeed, but it was trying. Creating for the United States a very, very serious uh, need to commit very, very serious resources to uh, its security policy during the Cold War. Um, Vigorous competition from the Soviet Union throughout the Third World, uh, in response to which the United States made commitments all around the Third World, intervened twice in extremely costly Asian wars, buttressed dictators all around the world out of fear that they would fall to the Soviet Union, engaged in a very, very uh, serious arms race that occupied the energies of the government, ran risks in numerous uh, nuclear and other kinds of crises. In short, faced a, a serious uh, counterbalancing and hegemonic rivalry constraint from a very, very serious peer rival. So I know what many of you are now thinking. You're saying, there goes the professor talking about this when we face all of these asymmetrical threats. Yes, the United States' unipolar position makes it hard to compete with the United States at that level, so 
uh, America's opponents or rivals go for asymmetric strategies? My response is going to be a little bit flip, but it's serious. If you think asymmetrical strategies are bad, try symmetrical ones. Think back to the Cold War and remember what a symmetrical one was like. Um, so the fact that other major powers, the fact that uh, China and Russia don't always agree with the United States, uh, that they sometimes refuse to cooperate with the United States because they don't agree with it, uh, the fact that they sometimes provide diplomatic, political, and other forms of support to regimes the United States is at loggerheads with, such as Iran. The fact that those two countries occasionally cooperate and seek to exclude the United States, as happens, all of those are true. They're important. I care about them. I study them. But they pale in comparison to what real counterbalancing, what real hegemonic rivalry was like, and which I suggest would be far more likely if the world were more balanced, which is to say, if other countries had the capacity to mount more serious challenges to the United States, there is a some probability that they would do so. Not inevitable, but so certainly a probability. One way to think about this is to spend a lot of time reading what Russian commentators say, what they say, and immerse yourself in the Russian discourse about world affairs. And you read what the Russian elite says and ask yourself, if those guys had a $12 trillion economy, and they had the military forces the United States has, would they be inclined to compete with the United States a little bit more? I think it's very hard to spend much time reading that language and that way of thinking about world politics without reaching a positive answer to that question. Would it be as bad as the Cold War? I don't know. Maybe not. But it would be present a kind of challenge that doesn't exist today, and it doesn't exist in part because the United States' position in international politics is based on such a strong material foundation that I've called unipolarity. Simply put, to challenge directly the United States, to risk a prolonged, sustained rivalry with the United States uh, is beyond the means of the other great powers, and therefore they don't take steps that could lead in that direction. So those are benefits the United States achieves or gets from by virtue of the fact, or at least in part by virtue of the fact, that the world is unipolar. We often forget them because they're things that are bad that aren't happening. Now, so bottom line is I'm suggesting it has certain benefits. Unipolarity does, which brings me to the fourth point, that maintaining unipolarity is not especially costly for the United States. Um, if the United States gain these relative benefits of absence of uh, kind of pure great power rivalry only at the cost of massively expensive foreign policy commitments. If it could obtain these benefits only by massive sacrifices and risks, then it might be a not such a good deal for the United States. But I want to suggest to you that the unipolarity itself as a structural setting of politics does not necessarily and has not actually extracted major, massive, or unsustainable costs on the United States. The first thing to point out here is, excuse me, the first thing to point out here is that this situation of one superpower world did not emerge because the United States undertook some massive new foreign policy or grand strategic commitments. It's not as if sometime back in 1991 or 1992 the United States said, I'm let's, let's impose tons of new costs on America in order so we can have unipolarity. Unipolarity didn't emerge as a result of a new commitment by the United States. Unipolarity emerged because the fundamental great power challenger to the United States the Soviet Union collapsed. Unipolarity, in a sense, fell into the U.S. lap, not through new engagements and new commitments, but through the collapse of a challenge to the U.S. when it was already in a position of primacy over the Soviet Union in terms of its basic power resources. The U.S. has actually dramatically reduced its commitment, its national commitment to foreign policy from the era of the Cold War. The peak Cold War years saw an average U.S. defense commitment 
of 7 to 10% of GDP. Today, it's 4 to 5% of GDP. Without suggesting anything other than that the struggles in Afghanistan and Iraq are serious, difficult, costly, and bloody, compare them to the Cold War wars the United States found itself in, in Indochina and in Korea. Those wars exacted a price in terms of U.S. killed in action of something like 85, 90,000 American servicemen. We had 550,000 active duty in Vietnam. And if we're thinking about the collateral damage in terms of civilian casualties in both of those conflicts, dwarf any estimate of what's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. We had an arms race that was consuming huge portions of GDP and expertise. We had interventions. I'm only mentioning to you the headline interventions, not all of the smaller, unsung, but nonetheless costly interventions during the Cold War. And we had crises, superpower crises. Anybody remember these? Things like, well, no one's going to remember from personal experience. I don't think. It goes pretty far back. Berlin, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, there was a crisis over uh, nuclear alerting during the Yom Kippur War in 1973. There was even a crisis that not so many people know about in 1982 when the United States NATO did a, an alert exercise called Abel Archer that created a war scare in the Soviet Union. In hindsight, they were starting to get really nervous and take certain actions that raised the risk of nuclear war. In short, routinely in the Cold War, the United States undertook policies. In this, it felt in necessity. It felt for the national security of this country, for the security of these people. It undertook actions in crises that raised, however slightly, the risk of a global thermonuclear catastrophe. Um, those things were the kinds of foreign policy commitments that were, if not routine, they were a hallmark of the Cold War. By comparison, the costs and risks undertaken by the United States in the post-Cold War unipolar era, while serious, are not as high. Neither the cost in terms of the size of deployed forces, the GDP, the overall downside risks run in crisis, or even as bad as the death toll is, even in terms of the death toll uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan compared with Vietnam and Korea. So the bottom line here is that we did not undertake dramatic new commitments when unipolarity came into being. They are not necessary for the creation of unipolarity. And overall, the US commitment to foreign policy has been lower under unipolarity than it was under bipolarity, and indeed lower than was typical of most great powers in multipolar systems. The second thing to bear in line here, too, is that at least some of the headline-grabbing, expensive, costly policies the United States has undertaken since the end of the Cold War and the emergence of this unipolar world. Many of these policies are not absolutely necessary for the maintenance of a unipolar international system. Probably the best example of that is the war in Iraq. Whatever one Whatever your position is on the war over, uh, in Iraq, whether it was a uh, misguided or a uh, 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 sound policy decision, it's difficult to argue that that war was necessitated, was necessary in order for the United States to maintain its position as a unipolar state. If we try to rerun history where the United States had opted for a policy of containment of Saddam, um, it's not it's hard to make the case that somehow as a result of that the U.S. would no longer be uh, the sole remaining superpower on the world stage. So we shouldn't confuse policies the United States has undertaken uh, for important or not important reasons with policies the United States had to do in order to maintain its status as a unipolar power. Now, some people argue, a lot of my academic colleagues make the following argument. They say, unipolarity is self-defeating and will ultimately destroy itself. Why? Because the US doesn't face a peer competitor to induce common sense and restraint. And without that peer competitor out there to induce common sense and restraints, we'll do all these crazy policies. We'll go on the war path. And the result will be we'll overextend our resources, we'll be overcommitted, and we'll be compelled to scale back. 
That's the standard argument among academics for why unipolarity is unstable. It's through overcommitment of the United States. I reject this argument on logical and historical grounds. On historical grounds, first of all, uh, it, just looking at the history of international relations, it's not clear to me how having a peer rival necessarily induces caution. I mean, Vietnam was a policy followed when we had a peer rival. In fact, it was the peer rival that induced the United States to invade, uh, to, attack, uh, to uh, seek to defend South Vietnam. Um, so all of the costs I referred to, to, all of the risks the United States run, were all ran during the Cold War, were all undertaken with a peer rival. So the idea that balance in international relations induces restraint, uh, I don't necessarily think that it follows. That said, it's the case that the United States under a unipolar system probably can choose different grand strategies. There's nothing about unipolarity per se that demands the United States maintain its current highly activist grand strategy. That said, now allow me to make my fifth point. And as promised, they get shorter. Each one gets shorter. And that is, I think that an activist kind of leadership-oriented grand strategy, such as what the United States has really been following since 1945, is probably, I say probably because of scholarly humility, is probably in the best interests of the United States going forward. Um, the U.S. could follow a much more restrained foreign policy, and many argue very persuasively that a massive or a significant scaling back of U.S. commitments abroad, security commitments in particular, is in the U.S. interest. And indeed, unipolarity makes that a perfectly possible policy for the U.S. to pull back. Wow. Um, but. Uh, on balance, I would suggest continuing a policy of engagement, of relative activism, probably is in the best interest. And what do I mean by that strategy? Well, it was brilliantly laid out by Walter Russell Mead, but if in case you weren't here, it basically means maintaining a very widespread alliance system with numerous security guarantees that seek to provide leverage over these allies also dissuade some of these allies for undertaking policies that might be regionally dangerous. It involves security guarantees that seek to reduce the probability of regional rivalries being stoked. Classic example of this would be the U.S.-Japanese Security Treaty that we think dissuades a, a, a potential Japanese decision to rearm, which would potentially provoke an East Asian arms race that would be dangerous. The strategy involves the U.S. Uh, having a relative activist foreign policy on key security issues in global affairs like prolif proliferation of nuclear weapons, uh, terrorism, um, strategies that the U.S. seeks to kind of strongly influence global responses to these kinds of problems. You're all familiar with this because that's the foreign policy we've had for so long. A foreign policy finally a grand strategy that's quite activist with respect to international institutions that seeks to be engaged. Pardon? Oh, sure. What do I do? Do I hit B again? No. No, so quite all right. That's a sign that I've talked too long, clearly. <laughs> um, so I'll take the hint. Uh, no, that's, so that's basically the grand strategy that I'm talking about, kind of activist. Um, so why do I think that's probably better than restraint? It's a tough call, you know, but on the margins, I think it has the following virtues. First, I think the strategy might slow the rate of drift towards a bipolar or multipolar world, primarily because by providing security or in increasing the sense of security of several key actors in the international system, the U.S. grand strategy decreases the incentives for those powers to ramp up their capability and come become full-fledged nuclear weapons owning large force wielding great powers. So on balance if you can increase security through engagement you might decrease the rate at which the international system generates really se seriously scary military powers. Um, in addition uh, it Having a relatively activist engaged strategy does, I think, help foster 
international cooperation on some key issues. And there are, it's not just liberal academics in Cambridge who believe this, it's even not so liberal academics from Hanover, New Hampshire like me who believe this. Namely, there are some global problems that do require international cooperation. And having a power with a lot of capabilities willing to forge these international coalitions to address problems like proliferation, global warming, whatever, reform of international economic uh, practices is arguably in the U.S. interest. The ability of the U.S., the leverage the U.S. has to lead international cooperation is in part a function of having a relatively activist foreign policy. A restrained strategy would leave the United States, I believe, with less leverage in these international negotiations and international arrangements which are arguably necessary or at least important for U.S. security. And finally, I do believe there's reason to think that by working with other nations in an activist manner to uh, reach kind of coordination on issues, to, to reform uh, the global institutions that we do need to manage international affairs, uh, to foster new norms, uh, to write new international laws, as the United States, by the way, has been doing vigorously in the area of terrorism and terrorist finance in other areas. Writing those rules, creating those institutions, I think does have kind of lock-in effects that the institutions that we might today create to deal with security problems might outlast the unipolar era, might last longer in the future. And one example I'll give you of this very quickly, of an institution that long outlasted the power that underlay it, is the British pound sterling. If you think about it, Britain had the world's reserve currency up until the end of the Second World War, or at least until the 1930s, depending on how you date when it collapsed. Um, our economy, the U.S. economy, passed the British economy in 1880. That's a 50-year period at least, if not 60, where they maintained this institution, the sterling as reserve currency, long after the power base had been eclipsed. I'm not saying that a similar 50-year window can be obtained, but Similar lag times are possible in these various international arrangements the United States seeks to foster. And therefore, an activist foreign policy, an activist grand strategy that gives the U.S. more leverage in these negotiations, arguably better serves the U.S. over the long run. But at the end of the day, I don't think grand strategic choices are the most important choices if we're thinking about how long unipolarity will last. And here I have to, as I'm coming to my last point, and here I finally do have to address some of the questions, at least, that Mike put to me, which is, which is what would the U.S. really want to do if it did want to delay the day in the advent of bipolarity or multipolarity? And that brings me to my sixth point, which is the most important foreign policy choices are domestic. You know, what's going to bring this international system to an end is not the strategies in foreign policy that's followed by particular countries. It's the domestic fate of the key powers that comprise the international system. The reason we're having this conversation today is largely because of domestic decisions, very wise ones, all, that were taken by the Chinese leadership when they decided on their faithful, historically faithful uh, economic reforms 20 years ago. Um, those decisions, those domestic choices, the industry and organization of Chinese people, the way they're putting their society together is resulting in this astonishing 10% a year growth rate that in addition to making China uh, the conversation about a future coming power has also lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Those decisions were domestic. Similarly, the U.S. today faces a severe problem of overstretch, massive indebtedness, balance, can't balance the budget. Fundamentally and largely, that is a result of domestic choices as well. Yes, there's a large defense budget. Yes, there are some foreign commitments. Those pale by comparison to domestic obligations that are unfunded that the United States has undertaken. The United States is in a fiscal position it is today not because of new foreign entanglements, but because it has a domestic political system that is incapable either of raising significant revenue or reducing significant expenditures. You gotta do one of those two things. And everybody in this room who is following American politics knows 
that our system is incapable of doing, one of them or some combination. That is why we are awash in red ink. That is why the Chinese are buying our debt to such an extraordinary degree. That is why the U.S. policy discussion feels so constrained. It's not the only reason why, I admit. We have a very strained uh, military due to extensive deployments. But the sense of constraint is, is I would say, 70 80% owing to domestic commitments. And therefore, getting your domestic house in order is the single most important thing the United States can do to affect its long-term trajectory in international politics. I will close, because I can't resist closing. closing. This is why I'm an academic and not a hard, uh, you know, policymaker or a, you know, an act, a, 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 a DC beltway active-oriented person. I'm up there in Hanover. It's because I can't resist closing my talk with kind of an ironic twist. Uh, which means, you know, it's, it's classic hopeless academic stuff. But there is a kind of irony in that this might be, this domestic politics piece might be the, 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 the real vulnerability of unipolarity. That is, the problem with unipolarity is not the absence of a peer rival means the U.S. goes off and does crazy things in international relations and, and, and becomes an overstretched empire. The problem with unipolarity may be that the absence of a peer rival reduces or uh, eliminates a potential binding force in domestic politics. I mean, in hindsight, of course, you know, it looks like there was this great Cold War bipartisan consensus. Of course, in reality, anybody who was around then remembers it was not that bipartisan. But let me say this. It was a hell of a lot more bipartisan than it is now. There was a lot uh, uh, more polarization. Polarization in the U.S. has kind of risen in tandem with the decline of a peer rival. Could it be that it takes a good old peer rival, none of this asymmetric stuff, it takes a real across-the-board peer rival to get Washington working properly? It might be. If that's the case, that's the hole in the unipolar donut. And with that, I will conclude and look forward to your comments and questions. I'll open it up to uh, questions and answers, but I'd like to make two observations before we do. First, um, as you ask your question, would you please identify yourself and your organization for uh, our taping purposes so that we can, uh, if possible or if necessary, come back to you and ask you to elaborate at some future point. Second, um, we'd like you to ask short questions. In other words, uh, we don't need a second speech, or we prefer not to have a second speech. So please keep your questions to actual questions, uh, as opposed to um, full presentations. So I, I then open the floor to questions. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. Do you have a metric that you use other than how much money we spend on weapons? to figure out what's good and what's bad. Um, I find it a little disturbing that you say we're good because we're spending so much on weapons. I mean, I sort of have the feeling that the Middle East is doing to us what we thought we were doing to the Soviets, which was getting us to spend so much we wouldn't have anything for our domestic concerns. And one of the interesting things that I'm concerned with is that the Chinese now, according to Joe um, Ziglitz, the Chinese have much better research labs than we have in the United States. They also have the fastest trains, and they are expanding their market across the country by using their transportation, why we have a dreadful transportation system here. Um, let's see, I had another point I wanted to make. And I guess I do think... Um, our educational system is really a mess, and we ought to be spending lots more money in that than in buying more weapons. I mean, half of the kids are not graduating from high school. Half of the kids that enter junior colleges don't graduate. Half of the kids that enter college don't graduate within six years. I mean, I think these are very disturbing indicators about what's going on here. And this whole idea about spending more money for weapons as a good idea, I find a little puzzling. So we're in crisis. We're declining, exactly as we have been for the last 60 years. I would say two things. First, 
the defense spending figure is not, I'm not putting, a, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's a measure of the scale of, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of getting an indicator of the scale of the U.S. military capability. If you really want to measure military capability, spending is not a great measure because obviously some things in the United States are extremely expensive to buy that are cheaper in other countries and so forth. But that budget is just a quickie way of capturing the sheer scale of U.S. commitments to military capabilities. And I would su su str strongly um, uh, emphasize that a huge proportion of that is, uh, is human capital, not weaponry. Uh, and that is one of the things that differentiates the U.S. military uh, from some of the potential competition, is that huge investment in the human capital side. But it's not an attempt to say it's good or bad or wisely spent. It's an attempt to capture U.S. military capabilities. Then the question is, is there a direct trade-off between those commitments and spending on education? Uh, as a professor at a college with two school-age kids, I'm all for spending more money on education. Let me just vote for that. I vote for that, absolutely. Um, and it's possible that you could gain some revenue from scaling back defense commitments. If you'd go for an offshore balancing or restraint foreign policy, you could probably knock a chunk. Various people have estimated how much that chunk is. I personally think 100 or 150 billion is a pretty big number of what the U.S. could do if it opted for a much more restrained grant strategy. $150 billion is nice. It pales by comparison with our budget deficits. So the way you're going to fix the problem of, uh, if there is a problem of lack of government spending on infrastructure and education, is going to be to get your domestic house in order. Uh, foreign policy scalebacks, even in the most radical scaleback scenario, will not provide sufficient revenue to solve the problems that you're mentioning. So again, it's a, it comes back to a domestic politics question, I'm pretty sure. Can you, is it on? Uh, I'm Samira Daniels, uh, Ramsey Decision Theoretics. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, ask you to refine a point for me, which is that, um, you say that, you know, I mean, I, I might, I would concede that the United States has no peer rival as such. And, but perceptions are, <laughs> are everything. And um, in our society, you know, we have a very diverse uh, population and lots of immigrants who have brought with them um, their, their understandings of what are world threats. And I, you know, since I've lived in the academic community, I, I see a 30, 40 year history <laughs> of this. And um, I guess that while, you know, s uh, s there are that don't see a pure rivalry, th these particular domestic groups do, do see a rivalry, uh, uh, you know, abroad. And I wonder to what extent those, those you know, immigrant rivalries uh, influence our perceptions of who is out there because you know you can talk to one ethnic group and they will see you know they will focus on one, uh, on, a, on another uh, depending on their historical uh, experience. So I was just wondering, uh, you know, whether we're just conflating and you know saying it's you know we have no peer rival, but it is a question of perception. Would you wouldn't you say and which which makes the grand strategy and grand design design even more complex and uh, difficult to sift through. Yeah, I mean, I see two pieces of that question. One is kind of the perceptions versus some attempt to measure capabilities through these very imperfect measures as opposed to what people think as one piece of it. And the second is perception of degree of challenge to the United States, uh, notwithstanding all of these you know, capabilities that you might throw into some graph. So on the first question of perceptions, that's a great question. I think perceptions matter, to s matter, matter in politics. People act on what they think, not on what some professor says. Uh, if they think they're a peer rival, then they think they're going to take on the United States. Or if they think that the United States is, is, is going to be displaced, they, they will act on that. Um, I've actually, uh, I have a limited capacity to study everything. But one of the things I've 
tried to do as best as I can is keep up with the conversation in various parts of the world. You, you know, you read Russia as the uh, a country that I grew up studying in the Cold War when it was still the Soviet Union. What is the elite, read carefully, what is the elite conversation actually about? The first thing you'll notice if you look particularly at Russia, I think my friends who study China uh, will say similar things, is that they, they say the world's multipolar. That's the first thing. It's multipolar no matter what some maniac professor might say. Um, but if you read carefully, what do they mean by multipolar? Do they define multipolar the way I defined it? And the answer is actually no. By multipolar, they mean there's a lot of important actors. And it's not a world where the US can dictate what it wants. And it's not a world in which the US gets to rule by fiat and we just have to go along with them. They conflate unipolarity with unilateralism. If you rephrase the question and look in these domestic discussions in the various capitals of the world and say, is there another superpower that is basically comparable to the US, close to comparable, like the Soviet Union? No one will say the answer to that question is yes. If you ask them, or you read, you know, how long will it take before the US is just you know, one power that's pretty much the same capabilities as, the, as a bunch of others, they'll say, a long time. In other words, if you really read what they say, they're not actually disagreeing with this portrayal. It's just the, comment, the commentary and the expectation is once again going through this periodic phase of over-interpreting global power shifts that I've witnessed several times uh, in the past and I've studied uh, several times in the past. The second thing is about the perceptions of threats. And in a way, this goes back to your question about it, about um, uh, you know, security commitments and degree of threat and to what, how do we allocate resources between this massive military commitment uh, versus uh, domestic. My uh, talk, my view, is actually on the optimistic side. It's very hard to speak like this in front of a, a group of Washington insiders who are themselves engaged in, many of them, I should say, are engaged in very difficult policy realms with very serious challenges. For some academic to step in and say, well, as bad as those are, you know, you should see how bad they were back in the Cold War. The thing is, I actually believe that that's true, that we perceive the challenges that we're confronted with as existential, critical challenges. Um, and there are, there, 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 something did happen on 9-11 that jarred American sense of, sense of security in a way that almost nothing that happened during the Cold War did. But that said, I actually think the degree of latitude for the United States to make choices, uh, the degree of latitude for the United States to shape its strategic environment uh, is much greater than many analysts, many analyses, many uh, strategic reviews would have you think. If you step back and look at it, um, uh, uh, the security challenges start to look more, th there, starts to get, there starts to be some space created for thinking about shaping the environment over the long term uh, as opposed to responding to these immediate challenges when you realize that the world is likely not to experience that kind of you know, great powers going at each other full tilt that was actually typical of international politics for most of history. It's really quite unusual and extraordinary. And in fact, just to end this, uh, this response to your excellent question, overall great power military commitments, as huge as they look, are low by historical standards. The US is 4.5%, China is 3%. Um, I triggered that thing again. Um, Europe, of course, as anyone who studies NATO knows, Europe ridiculously low. Uh, India, even Russia, which has a pretty low by historical standards. And the U.S. numbers look huge because the U.S. has a huge economy. It's lower commitment than we had in previous international settings, lower than has been typical, and that's a good thing. Uh, thanks for an interesting talk, Margaret Polsky, George Mason University. Given the way you've defined polarity and in the context of thinking about strategy and rethinking strategy, what if the, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming with your measure, your measure is fairly consistent over a couple of centuries as you've used it. Are the strategic capabilities of the 19th and 20th century 
the same strategic capabilities that we need in the 21st century. If those capabilities have changed, are we measuring the right things when we're looking at polarity? Um, uh, the answer is yes. And the answer to this excellent question is yes and no. Again, it depends on the question you're asking. If the question you're asking has to do with the most powerful actors in the international system, which are the great powers, and their capacity to do things to each other, then I think I'm using the right measures because those measures obviously have changed uh, absolutely over time. But what matters is relative to other great powers. If you look at those measures, what they capture is, and I can do obviously much better measures, but what they capture is great power capacity versus other great power in a given period. When it was wooden ships of the line, it was wooden ships of the line. When it was dreadnoughts, it was dreadnoughts. Um, when it's big tank armies, it's big tank armies. Um, and the, I think the measures that I gave you faithfully, roughly, again, roughly captured the great disparity in high end, great power, great power, military capabilities between the United States and other great powers. But the second part of your question is, but what about all the other things that military capabilities are supposed to be used for? What about things like uh, countering the threats that are actually current, like non-state actors? What about things like counterinsurgency? What about uh, tasks in international politics that are not directly military related? Are they the right measures for that? And the answer is, in many cases, they're not. Um, that is to say, looking at those numbers gives you a wildly disparate sense of what the U.S. might accomplish in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan, just as, by the way, the same numbers would have misled you about Vietnam or they would have mis misled you about um, Britain's capabilities in South Africa and the Boer War. I mean, counterinsurgency has never, ever, ever been easy. There's nothing new about the fact that high-end, great power-oriented military capabilities have a very, very hard time creating favorable outcomes uh, in, against uh, insurgent uh, or guerrilla actors. This is an old refrain that goes back hundreds of years in international politics. So my answer is yes and no. I believe that the, the kinds of characterization of polarity matters for great power relations. And as I've suggested throughout the talk, I think great power relations still matter even if only it's about the dogs that aren't barking. Um, but the, the, uh, the second part of your question, the yes part, is to be sure these capabilities are not necessarily the relevant ones for a range of problems that are quite important today. And I'm not denying that that's the case. Commander Esther McClure, United States Navy. You define polarity as how usable capabilities are distributed in the international system. How do you consider nuclear weapons? Are they usable capabilities or not? And what is your reasoning for that? The uses of nuclear weapons are, um, uh, well, the, the, the standard view of nuclear weapons is they have a wonderful use, a reliable use, uh, namely deterrence. Uh, that once you obtain a second strike capability, a, cap a capacity to retaliate against any conceivable attack, that your homeland is probably safe from uh, invasion and occupation by a hostile power. That is to say, on matters of existential security, uh, nuclear deterrence is likely to be credible, and um, potential adversaries are likely to believe that s a certain range of actions will invite a self-negating, self-destroying response. So that's a great use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's why a lot of states want to have them, although gaining the secure second strike part of that thing is not so easy. About that, most people are sure. So there's one use. And it does affect um, the implications of polarity for such matters as two states going full tilt at war with one another, as we discovered in the Cold War. That's why all my examples I gave to you of great power rivalry were about other kinds of rivalry than direct attack. Because I understand that in today's nuclear deterrence world, those kinds of concerns of another sort of uh, Second World War writ large are, for the time being, um, uh, not uh, highly likely owing to nuclear deterrence. When you move from that basic question about homeland def 
defense from foreign attack and occupation to other realms, I think you will find uh, great uncertainty about the, what e nuclear weapons uh, can be used for. And I think it's fascinating that at least in the act, and now I'm going to do a little bit of, you know, call for more work, <laughs> call for more thinking. It was quite remarkable that the end of the Cold War didn't end, but dramatically reduced our commitment to studying nuclear deterrence issues. There was a ton of stuff on nuclear deterrence during the Cold War. Every new, every new academic journal that came out, there'd be another attempt to think through the intricacies of how to create a stable balance between these two states. Now that the world is far more complex in terms of nuclear, now that we have weak proliferators, proliferators that have weak nuclear arsenals, vulnerable nuclear arsenals, there's a range of questions that I personally don't know the answer to. Suppose Iran gets a nuclear capability that's totally uh, vulnerable. What does it do? Does it make Iran's secure, does it make Iran's existential security something that can be relied upon? Namely, no one is going to attack, conventional attack, and occupy Iran. Probably, although if they can be taken out with a first strike. Then when you start going beyond the fears that are, that are at large today, particularly in Israel, about would that then make, would having such a weapons capacity make Israel, um, Iran relatively immune from retaliation if the attack comes from terrorists or other groups that are supported by Iran? Does that then, no one knows the answer to these. These are very uncertain questions, and I would be uh, highly uh, hubristic if I claimed that I knew the answer. So that's a long-winded way of saying I'm pretty sure that these nuclear weapons have a use of deterrence and therefore wipe out the significance of polarity for those, for those existential defense issues, but not for other kinds of great power rivalry, which in fact have been quite important historically and could return if the world were to return to buy our multipolarity. Bob Vallon from the Air Staff. Uh, I can't challenge your uh, statement, or, or I'm inferring it anyway, that there is a competitor to land, sea, or air power from the U.S. The US's power. But I have to ask about a couple of other domains and whether or not we are, in fact, in a unipolar world today, space and especially cyber. Are those existential potential threats to the U.S.? Does the U.S. security establishment have uh, any uh, anything they should be doing in those areas. And uh, the last piece I'd, I'd offer, just as a thought, uh, the bipolar world that we had with the Soviet Union was, I think you've outlined it beautifully, but the threat to the U.S. posed by the uh, terrorists or insurgents or whatever, it has resulted in more casualties to U.S. citizens. Is that or the reaction to it, the civil liberties threat that we would have to react to, is that an existential threat to the United States? Are, are those things we should be concerned about? I think that, uh, let me take the last part first. The, um, the, how do you compare an actual attack where civilians are, innocent civilians are harmed by a hostile foreign force with the risk that there would be a far more devastating, far more devastating a nuclear war. So the Cold War saw us taking some risks. Now, we can't estimate those risks, even with the benefit of historical research in hindsight. It's very hard to know how close really were we. What we know is that leaders knowingly took risks, knowing that in the, they believed it was necessary to take short-term risks of a potential nuclear use in favor of much longer-term security for the United States, mainly in terms of defending the U.S. reputation for credibility, which was thought to be crucial to Cold War nuclear deterrence. How do I compare that? I think it's very, very difficult to do so. Civil liberties in the early Cold War also suffered to a degree in the United States owing to the fear. In part, the fear was not just of nuclear, the fear was of subversion. Um, so, uh, I think it's an understandable reaction as a, as a, from my, I, I will be quite frank in saying from my ivory tower perspective, which I know, I will say I, you know, 
don't know whether it's appropriate to say this, but I did have a, 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 a relative who, who, who lost his life on that day. But from an academic perspective, I actually think the dangers of the Cold War were larger. They were larger because the negative possible consequences of failure was essentially the end of the U.S. polity. The end of it, the end of this thing that we have, the United States, the end, the end of a lot else in the world. Whereas I'm not aware of credible scenarios where Al-Qaeda-like organizations can constitute that kind of threat. So it's a higher probability of a much lower, though significant, negative threat. To the first question, uh, the answer is if you break up power, that could be a cyber attack. If we, <laughs> is anyone else besides me hearing? I'm hearing a little feedback. Um, they're coming after us. They're coming right through. The, um, if, you, um, if you break up various components of capability and seek to measure on an on a, on a arena by arena, theater by theater, capability by capability basis, then there's no question that in certain areas the U.S. stops looking unipolar. Unipolar, the, the term polarity, the usefulness of the term, is limited to a very important realm of great power relations that shape a lot about world politics, but don't capture everything. The minute you start breaking it up and looking at particular elements, it's quite possible that the U.S. might be, uh, there might be much more multipolarity or bipolarity in other capabilities. Personally, I, have, I lack the knowledge base to assess the level of threat. Uh, things that I have read makes me think that both of these issues that you mentioned, cyber and space, are things to which any uh, United States government should be paying uh, serious heed because the, the potential downsides, particularly of shutting down uh, uh, um, uh, our uh, capacity to act in terms of our internet, uh, is are the downsides are so dramatic. Um, but I, I lack the expertise to actually assess that. The big point is if you aggregate and look at overall capabilities, I would stand by my assessment. If you break it down into particular areas, there will be areas where the United States may look uh, vulnerable. Paul, Paul Peroni, uh, uh, task. Is the question not really uh, going from a unipolar system to a multipolar system, from a unipolar system to a uh, chaotic system outside the United States? I mean, if you look at places like Russia and China, the demographic problems they're having, isn't there a possibility of a collapse of a nuclear armed state? And then you've got a completely different problem that I don't think we've ever faced before in the past. Well, I think that uh, uh, the term that is thrown around by various pundits, commentators, and scholars is apolar. So you have no poles. Uh, you have no states. It's a possible, possible world in which there are no states that, are, that have grand strategies and domestic uh, mindsets and institutions that make them uh, capable of managing and playing a role in global leadership, the resolution of global issues. And, and some, some, some argue that that's a world even more scary than, than, than multipolar, worrisome than multipolar would be a world apolar. But I, you know, again, I can't estimate the probability of that. I actually think Russia, from the standpoint of a Russia watcher, was more likely to be lacking a coherent government in the 90s than it is today. Whatever we may think of the government, the Russian state as an entity that is ostensibly controlling activities in this vast expanse of a sixth of the world's surface that is Russia is uh, with all of its faults and problems and aspects that are not particularly pleasant is doing a, a quote unquote better job of, of maintaining a Russian state than was the case in the 1990s. China obviously seems from the surface in terms of broad indicators, extremely well governed in some ways, if not democratically governed. But again, China experts warn of all sorts, of, just like the conversations we have here, even in a country that's growing at 10%, which you would think would be, everybody would just be having a huge party and it's celebrating. In fact, tons of challenges, environmental, demographic, uh, all sorts of need to reform institutions to cope with an aging population. Uh, so, Plenty of conversations being held there, and the standard view from people who study China is, you know, not a huge, you know, the G2 thing, not a huge desire to step up and, and, and undertake lots of global responsibilities just now. 
Uh, so in that sense, I think there's some evidence for what you're suggesting. But complete breakdown, I think, is less, uh, is l I, see, I see less evidence for than I did in the 90s. Thank you very much. Justin Logan from the Cato Institute. Thanks very much for the talk. It's a terrific talk, and uh, I think it's very persuasive. I wanted to ask you a question about your theory, because it seems to me that you're telling a story not just about the polarity of the international system, but about grand strategy. And grand strategy is ultimately about inducements and constraints. There are constraints on grand strategy, you say, I think, interestingly. Uh, structural constraints never really bound that tightly during the Cold War. We did some wild and crazy things that were very costly and, in retrospect, uh, deleterious to our power. But importantly, you say there are no structural constraints on U.S. grand strategy today, or they don't bind very tightly. I think the term that you used was nothing will compel a grand strategy shift uh, in a policy-relevant future. But by extension, what are the inducements to U.S. grand strategy? Um, and if you're saying that there are no or very few structural constraints uh, I exerting themselves on U.S. grand strategy, are there sort of structural inducements, that is to say sort of wise sorts of inducements to U.S. grand strategy, or is it possible that the sort of dom the pathological domestic politics that you've described in the domestic scene will lead to a sort of deleterious, uh, 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 harmful U.S. grand strategy. So do you sort of buy that story of inducements and constraints? And if you're saying that there are no or few structural constraints, are there structural inducements? That's a great question. I think, uh, again, uh, 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 you know, the more you know about, you know, how policy is actually made, you know, Many people in this room know it from a contemporary sense. I have gained a, a sense of it uh, from very close up historical studies of great power decision making uh, through history. You know, the less you, you know, the harder it is to believe, you know, that anyone other than Bismarck really had a grand strategy. In some sense, it's a kind of a, it's a story we tell, we, we, we kind of go out in the world and do stuff. And then intellectuals, you know, with tweed jackets, oh, you've got the tweed jacket, the tweed jacket guys come. <laughs> and tell a story about this, you know, here are the four key objectives and the keys that lock up the world, and we did that. So, um, so th I take that point, that, uh, that there might be a domestic system that is, uh, that is not well, that is not, that is not very capable of making tough domestic choices. It may also not be capable of making dramatic and tough uh, foreign policy choices, although that said, there was a substantial shift in American approaches to the world after 9-11, uh, and, um, and there has been a substantial shift back. So within, the, within that range of pretty activist strategies, you can choose various ones. You can increase or decrease the military element. You can have a very engaged grand strategy that decreases the military element. You could, you could seek to draw down, continue to draw down in, uh, in Iraq, and ultimately draw down, back down in Afghanistan. And try to eschew further large-scale military commitments while nonetheless being very active. So at the end of the day, what would the inducements be? I think, you know, Grant's, the future is a, a guess. We, 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 we're taking a bet. When you make a strategy, when you take a policy, you're guessing, you're betting that the future will be better if I do this policy than if I do some alternative. And the bet that American policymakers are making, whether they're doing it kind of, uh, you know, super consciously or just uh, uh, dealing with every crisis each day, the bet they're making is that the U.S. will be more secure in a future in which the U.S. has a lot of leverage to shape outcomes than it will be in a future in which it is disengaging. American officials that I talk to, that I interact with, and over the years, when I even go back to policy documents from the Cold War, think that this word engagement, this, you know, we're putting security, we're giving security guarantees, we're our military, military ties, we're, at, we're building economic institutions, we're making all these commitments. That involvement creates leverage and ability to shape outcomes. Now, of course, lots of times it fails. The U.S. president goes, can't even convince the Olympic Committee to bring the games to his hometown. And so everybody says, well, what are we really getting for this? And it becomes a very difficult calculation. What are we getting? And many of the people who support a more restrained foreign policy don't believe that's a good bet. They believe the risks inherent in seeking to be very engaged, to be trying to influence things all around the world, to seek to be a key player in all these disputes, which, which uh, uh, seems like a plus to the, current, to the current grand strategy. They see this as 
potentially quite dangerous, might pull us into a war that we don't want to fight. More American men and women might get deployed in, in, in struggles in which we don't, really don't have a national interest stake. So at the end of the day, it's a bet. But what I'm arguing is, is, the, is the, the points that I made in my presentation very briefly were, at the margins, I think that having this leverage to shape uh, how cooperation emerges today, having this leverage to reduce the intensity of security dilemmas in some key regions, arguably puts the U.S. in a better position for a long-term, secure world congenial to its interests than one in which the U.S. In, is, is disengaged. But as I say that, as a, as a scholar, I can say that it is ultimately an informed bet rather than absolutely obvious systemic imperatives pulling us in this direction. Well, this, this one's simple and short. Uh, Sir Major Gabe Grease, Defense Technology Security Administration. I really liked your slide uh, talking about the national narrative from the 60s to the present day. We talked about America being in decline. So from your studies, um, looking back, say, at Britain, was their national narrative always were in decline even as they were rising and falling? Is that just a nature of a, a superpower or a power at the top as we're always looking at ourselves and second guessing or trying to become better or what have you? So just what have you seen from your study of history? Well, inside the London equivalent of the Beltway, that's pretty much what it's like. I mean, that's what it's like to be responsible for the foreign affairs of a major power. It's to feel pressed, to feel under-resourced, uh, to feel as if you're being asked to undertake tasks with inadequate resources, inadequate backing, to feel that you're working on a hair string, uh, to feel that you're, you're going into each thing kind of, you know, with, with, with you know, uh, hoping for good weather and good luck because your government hasn't really put the resources there. That's very, very typical. Uh, 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 they did that all the time. Um, there was a period, perhaps it's influenced by hindsight, there was a period in which the Brits basically accounted for about 50, 60 percent of all industrial production in the world. It's a little bit like uh, what the situation the U.S. faced in the immediate wake of the Second World War, when all the other industrial economies had been basically laid to waste, and the U.S. produced basically half a world GDP. That made the conversation one about possibilities during this period. Um, it's kind of like being an Ivy League president before the financial crisis, you know, when your, your, your endowment was just kept every year, it was another 20%. It was like, well, what should we build next? That kind of conversation I think you can find during an interim when Britain was the, uh, had the benefit of having been the first country to industrialize. Just gave it potential that other countries lacked and opened up a kind of expansive conversation. I think a similar thing happened in this country at the dawn of the Cold War. And I don't think that's the conversation. I don't really expect us to have that conversation. I don't think even that would be a particularly healthy conversation now. So in a way, this talk about decline, the crisis, our schools are falling apart, that's probably a good conversation to have uh, so that we take the necessary action. And it's probably healthy to see this. Uh, but I would say, to back up to the first point, it's pretty typical to feel pressured uh, when you're running the foreign affairs of a major country. 